and introduce our first speaker today, who is our very own Ian Weaver. So Ian is a fifth year graduate student with Mercedes Lopez Morales. And prior to joining the CFA in 2016, Ian completed his undergraduate studies at UC Santa Cruz. And at the CFA, Ian mainly focuses on optical transmission spectroscopy of transiting exoplanets via the ACCESS survey. And today he's gonna to be presenting the latest results from that survey, which is the optical transmission spectrum of the hot Jupiter, the high gravity hot Jupiter hat P23b. So Ian, if you could take it away, please. For sure, thanks so much, James. Uh, sorry, I hope that pops up for everybody, okay? Yep, we've got that, thank you. Awesome, cool, so I guess I'll kind of just go section by section here. So yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, James. Uh, yep, I'm Ian. Uh, nice to see you all, so, sort of. Uh, so uh, I'm a fifth year grad student working with Mercedes uh, in the Access Survey, which has sort of gone through a couple different iterations for the acronym, and I'm kind of trying to come up with a new one right now just because we have so many different collaborators involved in this uh, in this uh, survey that we do. And sort of the uh, sort of like main takeaway from what we're trying to accomplish with our survey is uh, you know fill in sort of this parameter space and uh, the transmission spectra for exoplanets. Um, in the optical portion of the, uh, of the wavelength spectrum, because there's just not that much data there right now, and which is kind of a shame because uh, that's a really important uh, piece of the spectrum to have if you want to do things like break degeneracies between different transmission uh, spectrum models. Uh, I know David Singh has a great uh, figure for that, uh, where it sort of shows how the models sort of start to blend together in that uh, IR portion of the spectrum, but start to fan out in the optical. We can start to pick apart those models more. And so our survey is, you know, is uh, while uh, working to provide the data points uh, in that portion of the spectrum so that scientists can do uh, just that. And this particular target uh, is our most recent entry in the survey. Sorry, my video is flickering a little bit there. So our most, and also get my timer started too here. <laughs> so this is our most uh, also recent Porsche uh, entry to the spectrum. Sorry, I don't know if that's flickering on your end too, but my zoom is flickering. Oh, uh, that's no, gonna, we I'm can see move it. This. Okay, for sure. I'll just I'll just keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so this is our most uh, uh, recent entry, and uh, this particular target, HAPD twenty three B, is particularly special because it's so high gravity, and so that's where I want to sort of draw your attention to on this first figure right here. It's sort of just, I think I pulled this from I don't know maybe uh, I think right before this paper was submitted. So the um, sort of up to date, but you know it probably has changed since then. Number of exo the, um, detected transiting exoplanets, uh, and then we just have a few highlighted ones here. Sorry, my phone's also flickering. Here we go. A few highlighted ones here um, that have um, measurements uh, in the IR for uh, their water feature uh, strengths. And so on the x-axis, we have the uh, surface gravity of the planet. And on the y-axis, we have its, uh, uh, its uh, estimated or its measured um, equilibrium temperature. And uh, this sort of figure sort of originates from Kevin Stevenson's 2016 and, and his group's 2016 work, sort of trying to like find a pattern uh, between all these different observed exoplanets. And one pattern that they looked for was, you know, plotting the planet's surface gravity versus its, uh, uh, its uh, equilibrium temperature, and then seeing if there's a pattern uh, in terms um, the uh, strength of a particular water feature uh, in, the, in the higher portion of its spectrum, just to see if we can sort of start like coarsely grouping into two separate sort of classes here. And this sort of, that's sort of what this diagonal line right here is showing. This is sort of their sort of like rough way of sort of trying to divide us between uh, cloudy-ish planets in these more orange points, so like a uh, lower uh, water feature strength where it's being blocked by those cloud features uh, versus clearer planets up here with, uh, you know, like uh, more in the, of the blue points uh, where they have stronger water features that aren't being obscured by clouds in the atmosphere of the planet. And right here we have Happy 23B, and uh, I've sort of um I probably should have picked a different color for this. There actually is no uh, uh, measurement for the, its water feature strength right here, just because there's there's no data for it. There's really no optical spectrum, and there's uh, no IR data uh, either to build a spectrum. And so this study is sort of like sort of first entry into this, so that once we can in the future ideally combine this with IR data, we can see where this falls uh, in terms of the water feature strength, so we can sort of test this pattern. Uh, uh, was proposed by uh, Kevin Stevenson and his group. And uh, also just for comparison, here's um, uh, hap here's uh, sorry Jupiter down here. Uh, might probably a, a little bit further down, it's a little bit cooler, uh, but just sort of just to give you an idea of how the bulk of planets 
um, are sort of skewed towards uh, very uh, sort of like low gravity and hot planets. And so with this entry of HAPPY 23B, we're trying to start moving more over to the higher density sort of uh, population of these exoplanets to sort of, you know, try and start getting an idea of planets more similar to uh, well, our sort of only uh, Jupiter in our solar system, uh, because it's very similar in terms of surface gravity. And, you know, the ideal plant would be one that's, you know, much cooler down here, but those are much harder to observe, you know, of course. But this is sort of our way of trying to have a new entry that's novel in terms of its surface gravity, and it will, like, help us start, you know, pushing towards the solar parameter space over here as we uh, gather more and more data. And these other two plants are also are the, um, rarely, I guess, the only other two uh, sort of published data to date of what are, what are termed as high gravity uh, hot Jupiters, so HD 189733b down here and the MOS 43b over here, which we um, happen to also publish data for uh, recently last year. So next, I'd like to move over to sort of the data. Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna move my flickering window thingy out of this way for me here. <laughs> Okie doke. So uh, this section down here is sort of uh, just where I, where I next want to sort of like walk, uh, walk us through sort of the data reduction that we did for this survey. And so with Access, typically what we like to do is um, use um, a very uh, wide field of view um, on the IMAX, uh, on, our, on our spectrograph. And the one sector that we, we use IMAX is perfect for this because that's such a, such a large field of view. Uh, it's, like, it's so large, in fact, that we're able to um, uh, sort of capture many comparison stars, um, like on average, in the field of view for any particular target in our survey, which is uh, fantastic for doing uh, com uh, doing uh, comparison star uh, reductions here. So let me fix my phone here. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for detrending out the uh, common systematic effects uh, from our atmosphere, which we, can, uh, which we can do using comparison stars. And so uh, in this particular target, I think we had it was something like uh, three or four comparison stars. I'll let people check that. Uh, but we were able to uh, get really nice light curves in this detraining method uh, uh, with, those, uh, with, this, uh, with this vector graph that we use for our survey. And uh, up here in our bullet points, sort of just uh, sort of the uh, baseball cards or sort of like highlights. Uh, so we got five transits total from uh, this target, uh, sort of over about a span of three to four years. Uh, we were able to get this with a combined range from about 5,000 to 9,000 angstrom. Uh, and what was really nice about this uh, target too is we were able to, uh, by combining all these data sets, push down our uh, precision uh, our, that we were able to accomplish to around 247 or so parts per million uh, per bin in 200 angstrom bins in our wave in our uh, wavelength by wavelength um, bin uh, analysis that we did to build the uh, transmission spectrum. And uh, I sort of like roughly tried to color code it here um, by night. So we have our first transit up here in yellow and then transit uh, two in orange, three, four, and five. And then over here on the right are the corresponding uh, detrended parameters uh, for each night. Uh, just so we can sort of get an idea of how well our detrending procedure uh, is, is doing stability wise. And, um, and, and uh, hopefully as you can see here, it is actually, it, it is uh, very stable over the night, especially in terms of things like the mid transit time or the stellar density, which was actually a new thing that we were able to do for our survey with uh, recent uh, Gaia DR2 data to really uh, pin down uh, the dis uh, different orbital and system parameters uh, for this target, uh, which, is, which is like a really uh, a nice thing to get to do uh, with this uh, data set. And so uh, I guess I can move the next, uh, start moving down next to uh, once we have our um, white light curve uh, reduced data, we do the same uh, procedure uh, on a wavelength bin by wavelength bin basis to build our transmission spectrum. Uh, but, you know, just keeping the uh, white, I'm sorry, keeping the transit depth, uh, I'm sorry, not keeping the transit depth, keeping all the parameters fit uh, the white light curve values except for the transit depth so that we can uh, build our spectrum. And that's what these uh, black points here um, are showing. This is um, our combined uh, data set from all five nights. And this is the built out spectrum that we then fit uh, four models to just to sort of get an idea of um, what we're, of how large we can expect features to be. Um, because th again, this is a very high uh, surface gravity planet, uh, which means that the um, corresponding features in its atmosphere are, are much smaller. Uh, in fact, for this planet, if I'm sorry, if I scroll back up here real quick, 
it's about 300 ish, like 3 380 ish or so parts per million uh, if you assume a hydrogen dominated atmosphere. So like we're just getting below that limit there. And so uh, we want to, you know, sort of as a sanity check, see what um, some different forward models might look like uh, uh, in terms of those, um, in terms of the characteristics of this planet going into the, to the model. And uh, what we saw was something uh, kind of interesting. The best fit model um, had a preference towards TIO in this uh, planet's atmosphere. And uh, um, over here, you sort of see the very small uh, sodium features uh, and basically non existent potassium features in this uh, page, just, uh, just given the data that we have. Uh, so this uh, was really the preferred model uh, from doing this forward modeling. But, you know, again, that's not the end of the story. What we want to do is uh, actually run retrievals on our models to see if the, if the uh, retrieve parameters, uh, retrieve abundances rather, are in agreement um, or not. Uh, but before we could do that, we had to, you know, think about everybody's uh, favorite, um, favorite extra kink in the, in the process, uh, stellar activity. This is, a, a Happy 23B is a, uh, I think uh, I'll go back and say it's a, it's a G type star. I can double check that real quick for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a G type star, a G zero star, uh, which aren't really known to be uh, super, super active, but it's still active enough to uh, have our transit depths vary by, uh, by uh, a non-negligible amount from night to night. And so what we need to do is take that into account before we can combine our spectrum on a common baseline. And to do that, uh, we use the GP to model the photometric activity from um, assassin uh, photometric monitoring data to get an idea of sort of the amplitude on the, uh, 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 the amplitude on the flux of the star over time. So I'm just gonna move this over here. And, uh, and what we found was using our assumptions from the forward modeling of, of having TIO uh, being favored in the model, take that assumption, uh, apply it to the star. So if we assume that the TIO is originating from the star's atmosphere, uh, then given the photometric uh, variation in the flux, uh, and given, um, sorry, other way around, and given the, the, uh, given the variation in the flux, uh, what would the corresponding spot covering fraction be if TIO was present in this star uh, for a G-type star, given these, uh, given these variations in the flux? And, and if, if we run that out, we get around a 2 to 2.6 uh, 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 range in spot coupling fraction. So on the low end, the 2.2% uh, percent corresponds to when we're in the troughs, and the 2.6 corresponds to when we're in the, uh, when the, in the peaks. And so this sort of gave us a way to uh, bound uh, our retrieval models uh, well, informed by the photometric activity data. And so we fed these into, and I guess take us to the next section here. So we fed these into our retrieval. So we kept the, uh, sorry, I can go back up here. We kept the Scabot covering fraction uh, fixed in our retrieval models for the models that do retrieve for uh, heterogeneities present on the surface of the star, uh, pinned at either 2.2 or 2.6, and then retrieved for everything else. And we did this for, uh, for clear, cloudy, and or hazy atmospheres. We did it for atmospheres com containing uh, sodium, potassium, or TIO. Uh, and then within the presence of stellar activity, uh, of a stellar heterogeneities where we have to take the uh, carbon fraction into account or doing it without. And then we additionally also did those retrievals, all different combinations with and without fitting for the reference radius of the planet because that is, well, it might be kind of strong to say it's known to be related to degeneracies in this uh, surface pressure of the planet because there's sort of some back and forth going on about that right now. But just to cover our bases, we did it with and without just to see what retrievals would bear out. And that's what this figure over here on the left shows. And I think I probably spent probably a little too much time trying to get the, uh, the colors right here and pick a, a legend. So I'm, I'm sorry that looks really busy, but uh, really we can sort of just focus on just this one panel right here to uh, sort of give an idea of what these retrievals are telling us. And so here on the x-axis, we have the different, all the different combinations of the abundances uh, that, uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier. And then on the y-axis, we have something called the relative log evidence. And so what we do in our retrievals is we use a nested sampling, uh, well, sampler, and what's really nice about nested samplers is that it returns the Bayesian evidence, which is fantastic for doing things like uh, model comparisons. 
And so what this is, is the log of the Bayesian evidence for a given model. So for example, if we go with the sodium one here, this four and a half-ish is the log of Bayesian evidence of sodium. Um, mine, we'll, we'll divide it, <laughs> divide the Bayesian evidence the same as a subtraction of the log. So it's uh, the log Bayesian evidence of the sodium minus the log Bayesian evidence of the model that had the absolute lowest Bayesian evidence, which uh, in this particular panel here corresponds to a corresponds to a group of bars with the missing bar. So that's sort of the game we can play here. So in this panel here on the left, the one that's missing is uh, this potassium. Uh, let me go over here. Is that right? Yeah, potassium, a clear atmosphere with only potassium. So that yellow bar is missing. So that's all. So all of these heights are relative to this one right here. So that's why this one goes to zero. And then similarly over here, this would be uh, the one that has no, I'm sorry, that had the lowest absolute uh, log vision evidence is sodium right here with this dark purple. So that would be with a clear atmosphere in the presence of a spot and of a cloudy atmosphere. So really uh, this clear just sort of keep, this clear sort of plus symbol sort of prepended to all of these is sort of just to keep the um, labeling consistent. Really, it should just be um, a cloudy atmosphere because you know we inject clouds into a clear atmosphere, but that's just you know it's getting into the weeds. So uh, going back to the big picture here, this is sort of a way of globally comparing all of the uh, evidences for all the combinations of the models just to see which one is the most preferred. And uh, in this particular model right here, we see that the most preferred one is a clear atmosphere containing TiO. Full stop. And similarly, if we fit for R naught, just to you know, take into account this, this possible degeneracy that might be happening with the surface pressure, we see the same thing. And so this is sort of a way of our just doing another sanity check and to uh, sort of confirm against our forward modeling that having a TIO in a clear atmosphere is a preferred model given um, the data. And so that's sort of the takeaway that we, got, we um, had from doing this uh, sort of like suite of different retrieval uh, models here. And then below here is just sort of a few different um, uh, characteristic sort of like a cherry picked models from up here, just sort of to guide the eye of um, how different features might look. And this solid uh, curve right here is the corresponding best fit uh, model from the retrievals above. I'm sorry, let me scooch this over here. Okie doke. So that's all well and good, but again, the uh, this is a a completely novel data set. There's really no other data in the optical or the IR to pull from to do uh, more comprehensive retrievals. So these results, we really have to hedge everything by saying that this really is marginal. We really need data uh, in the IR to really pin down our retrievals here. Let me move this back over here. I'm so sorry this keeps flickering for me. It must be very distracting having me always stopping and dragging stuff off screen. So we, uh, uh, we would like to get more data uh, outside of this optical portion of the spectrum so that we can ideally have a full optical to near IR spectrum to run a retrieval on. And so that's what we actually have a plan to do uh, next. Uh, for uh, HST cycle 29, we're going to be putting, in, putting together a proposal to get that IR data uh, with the G141 filter with FRC3. And then recently, Hannah Wakeford and her group published uh, work using the, uh, the new G280 GRISM in the UV. Uh, sorry, this keeps popping up <laughs> in the UV uh, for, uh, for, uh, their, uh, for their study of an explained atmosphere. And the results were looking very promising. And it looks like this is, we can get very good data uh, using this filter. And in fact, you know, the group uh, just looks absolutely fantastic, all the way from all the way down to you know, 250 or so um, over it. So, you know, near 500, we have good coverage that we can draw on. And so, um, the plan is to get this extra data, uh, sort of rerun this refuel process we have here and see if the results actually do stand that this, 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 this is a planet uh, containing TIO in its atmosphere. Um, so there's still you know, more work to do, but this is sort of the path forward with this uh, target. And uh, I think this would be a good point for me to sort of stop talking now and I'd be happy to take any questions. So, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much, Ian. So, do we have any questions for Ian? If so, please raise your hand in the participant window. Uh, Jamila. Hey, Jamila. 
Hello, lovely talk and beautiful figures. Um, oh, thanks, Jamila, appreciate it. Oh, no problem, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I have a general question as someone who doesn't really work on exoplanets at all. Um, can you, I guess, what would, I don't know if this is maybe like something that'll happen with future telescopes, but is there ever a point where you'd be able to sort of see uh, ex like exomoons in your transits as well, if the signal gets, you know, that fine? <laughs> oh, that'd be a great question to ask, to ask. I'm Alex Tichy. Oh. Okay. But um, so that's a that's a very uh, touchy. I, well, the last I heard touchy uh, topic. Uh, yeah, the, the data quality is not there. Okay. Not, that's, my, that's my hot take yet to definitively say that we can pick up exomoons. That's fair. Okay. Thank yeah, you. But I think oh, what's what's uh, what's the new uh, instrument that's going after that? Is it Louvre that's saying they might be able to do that? I haven't really been keeping up to date with the next gen telescopes too much. Well, what about JWST? Does that have anything for, is that offering anything for the exoplanet community? I, Ooh. I mean, in terms of exomoons, um, I don't know. I'm, I've, I haven't been involved in that, in that field really at all. I think oh, if, my, if, my, if, I don't know if anybody else in the, in the room is involved with that, I'd be interested to know myself. I guess, yeah, you, you need good out of transit baseline, right? To see something either before or after the exoplanet transit. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have any more questions? If not, I have a, a couple, Ian. Um, I was wondering, with the HST transit, do you think mm -hmm. that a single transit observation would be sufficient, given the planet's high gravity, to detect the TIO features? So, yeah, so we've actually been trying a few um, sample calculations with Pandexo. Um, but that currently, I think, only has the 141 filter that we can use uh, instead of the 280. And uh, I still need to, you know, go back through the numbers again. But we were getting around, I think, four transits uh, total with uh, with those calculations. Although I'm not sure how much of that is like due to overhead versus like uh, actually being able to pick up signal. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, another question: Can you remind me what the equilibrium temperature of the planet is, and whether or not? Because I think it's relatively cool right for the existing tio detections right sure sure yeah so it's around 2000 kelvin yeah so this could yeah, be so cool than mass 43b but a little bit hotter than hd yeah but this could be one of the cooler planets to show tio which i think is interesting in itself yeah that's true although you yeah. know again the fact that um I guess this, I still gloss over this a little bit. In this other panel here, when you do fit fur um, or not, you know, the gap is much smaller between TIO coming from the star versus the planet when you account for stellar activity, which is this light purple with the polka dot pattern. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really, we actually we do need that data in the IR and ideally in the UV to, uh, to have more and more robust retrieval um, results to draw from. Yeah, of course. Um, Adriana. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? <laughs> good, good. Um, good talk. Okay. Um, I may have missed it, but I was wondering if you had um, an estimate or an idea of the thickness of the atmosphere, because you mentioned um, that it has like high surface gravity, right? So I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how thick um, atmosphere it has, and you have like a transit, right? And so you need oh, yeah. Is my planet own... subtract that. Yeah, we can For see sure. your screen. Yeah, is that, is that popping up? Cool. Yeah, actually, yeah, we're a little yeah. calculated because I, I always, yeah, I always keep asking the same exact questions too, and I always have to yeah. go back and I'll, and I'll, you know, everybody has different um, stellar and planet parameters for their own study, so I always get slightly different values. And so if I mm -hmm. go over here real quick, from the one we use for our paper is this guy right here. So that is a scale height of uh, 276 kilometers. 276 kilometers. Cool. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else that implies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so sorry. So what, what, did, what did you want to know about the, what, like, in terms of like the scale height or how it compares for the signals? Um, yes, because you're saying like you are detecting titanium like oxide, right? Or TIO, TIO in um, the atmosphere of the planet, right? Right. You're sure, saying sure. that's from the star. Oh, right. Yeah, thanks for asking. So to uh, pick apart if it's coming from the planet or versus uh, from the star, that's what sort of, uh, if mm -hmm. I, if we, maybe it might be better, better if I zoom in a little bit. <laughs> so, 
Okay. Okay. If we just focus on this uh, light purple versus uh, this uh, yellowish one with the, with the stripes. So the one with the stripes, that's assuming a clear atmosphere without modeling for any stellar heterogeneity. So this means, this is every, if there's anything that's picked up, it's all coming from the planet. Whereas this purple one right here, that actually does uh, model a transmission spectrum, uh, injecting in a stellar model, uh, uh, a stellar model for the uh, spot as well. And so anything we pick up, if this bar, for example, was higher than this bar over here, then that would be evidence that the signal of TIA will be coming from the star versus from the planet, which I mean, I actually I know is actually a pretty uh, big concern for people working with M dwarfs when they try looking for water because you actually have water yeah. radiating in spots of M dwarfs, which I can't just like, besides the <laughs> fact that the spectrum just looks like a forest of lines already, that's just like another concern that I'm, I have nothing but respect for people that work with M dwarfs. That's a whole nother animal. <laughs> okay. And um, no, I'm just wondering, what is the y-axis on that? Oh, right, yeah, sort of, yeah, I sort of said that kind of fast. This is uh, what we call the relative log uh, Bayesian evidence. So it's, Okay, for uh, sure. Oh, <laughs> we got a posterior or some kind? Oh, yeah, I should have included some corner plots. Yeah, these are all uh, doing uh, nested sampling. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, right, right, corner plot, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this would, be, this would be a very busy figure if I put a corner plot for each one of these bars. <laughs> yeah. But, all right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. All right. Well, thanks again, Ian. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks. That was a Appreciate great talk it. and a, this is a thorough piece of work. Congrats. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, y'all. Uh, so we can move on to our second speaker. If you could go ahead and introduce Morgan Sam. Sure. Yeah, so our second speaker today is Morgan McLeod. Uh, he did his PhD at UC Santa Cruz, uh, after which he did a brief stint at the IAS and now is with us here at uh, the CFA as an ITC fellow. And today he's going to tell us about hydrodynamic modeling of exoplanet atmosphere escape. So I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, no, it's a real pleasure to be here and to get to talk to you all. Um, I you all circulated the email looking for uh, volunteers. And I was working on a project and I was, I was thinking, you know, maybe in about three months, it would be good timing uh, and I'd have some results to share. And it actually worked out really well. So I, I am in the process of like writing something up. So I'm really delighted to like have all of your questions and all of your feedback in this moment. So this is very much work in progress and I'm really excited to have the chance to share it with you while it's in progress because uh, I'm learning a tremendous amount and uh, you know I have a lot to learn from you all so uh, without further ado um, let's see how does that look on your screens is that okay okay great um, so uh, I have been thinking a lot about how um, exoplanet atmospheres are uh, photo evaporated over time and uh, how that uh, changes um, their um, appearance in transit spectra. Um, so we all know that planet populations are transformed by this process of photo evaporation of planet atmospheres um, and that you end up with things like inner rocky planets um, that are sort of remnants of perhaps boiled off gaseous planets. Um, and uh, in a few cases, we've really been lucky enough to get to observe um, some of the signatures of this escaping atmosphere in, in action. And so those have come mostly th through um, transmission spectra uh, during the transit of the planet. So if we have a planet which undergoes an optical transit, um, and we take spectra of uh, a few different lines that tend to trace um, either sort of stellar winds, or in this case, the absorption of the evaporating planet wind, we might see excess absorption, which correlates um, with that escaping atmosphere. So um, I'm gonna talk about uh, the metastable helium line, which is at um, 1083 nanometers. Um, there's uh, also a lot of work um, being done on Lyman Alpha. Um, of course, we aren't lucky enough to get to observe the sort of core of Lyman Alpha. So 
um, we are sort of left with information that's in high velocity wings for that line. Um, so uh, metastable helium has been a great probe of uh, stellar wind environments, um, as Andrea knows, for example. And um, we we are exciting to be to be you know using this uh, here to think about exoplanets. So uh, this first picture, which I have, is is kind of my schematic version of the um, environment that a photo evaporating sort of exoplanet uh, exists in. And the point that I want to make is that the star heats up whatever the instantaneous day side of that planet is, and that creates. Uh, high temperature, high pressure in the upper atmosphere, and that can drive basically an outflow away from the planet. But just like the planet exists in the radiation environment of this star, it also exists in this stellar wind environment. Um, and so these are very much sort of not uh, like clean expanding wind regions because there's uh, always a wind-wind interaction. Um, and we don't know what the sort of a priori, what the relative strengths of those outflows are. Um, there's also really interesting uh, dynamics about if, for example, a planet is heated um, non-uniformly across its sort of four pi steradians of um, ball, for lack of a letter, better word, um, uh, you know, across its sphere, then um, we might have really interesting outflow geometries where there's sort of material emanating, for example, from the day side that flows around to a cooler night side before sort of expanding kind of uniformly. Um, so uh, something really interesting about uh, these different tracers that we have, and I think a reason why it's exciting to potentially um, think about what more and more might be is that uh, they trace kind of different regions of the flow. So let's talk first about Lyman Alpha. Um, Lyman Alpha, which is of course an ultraviolet line we have access to in HST spectra, for example. Um, because we can't observe the line core, we have access to material moving in you know, 100 kilometers per second relative to um, some rest wavelength. And um, what that means is that uh, we have access to material moving quickly, uh, <laughs> you know, on the scale of a typical orbital velocity, for example, of, of a close-in exoplanet. Um, so we have things moving on the order of the orbital velocity. Now, as these sort of photoevaporative winds are launched near the surface of the planet, they tend to be much lower velocity, so like a few to 10 kilometers per second. And just qualitatively, um, that has to do with the escape velocity of the planet, but it also has to do with, at least in my mind, the fact that, that as much material is going to kind of boil off of this planet as possible. And that means that it's not a small amount of mass moving with very high velocity, it's a lot of mass moving just barely above the escape velocity of that planet. Um, so, uh, in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of great work um, uh, led by people like James and Antonia, um, who I've been collaborating on this work with, uh, detecting um, metastable helium absorption um, during transits of exoplanets and using that as a tracer um, primarily of this flow right around the vicinity of the planet. So we really strongly trace the densest regions um, with uh, this uh, metric, um, at least in the planets that we've observed, um, because typically it is um, either optically thin in most of the flow or uh, optical depth at most sort of of order unity um, in that line. And, what that means is that, you know, we're sort of strongly weighted towards these, these highest density regions. Um, and so this is a really great tracer of this sort of planet region flow. Um, so all of that sort of schematically said, um, 
What I have been doing is uh, building hydrodynamic simulations of that uh, atmosphere escape and in particular the wind-wind interaction. And we've been computing synthetic um, spectra by uh, post-processing these simulations in radiative transfer and trying to understand uh, what we would observe um, in very different scenarios. So uh, this picture, for example, um, I took an exoplanet, which is very broadly um, sort of motivated by WASP-107, um, which is sort of a Neptune mass planet uh, that uh, sort of amazingly has about a Jupiter radius, something like 0.96 Jupiter radius. So it's a very low density planet. Um, it has a uh, outflow that has been detected. Um, and uh, here what I'm looking at is what if we take an outflow that's about the magnitude to produce the observations of so some sort of mass loss rate similar to what's needed to produce the observed values and we change the stellar wind environment that that planet exists in. And so each of these panels is a different uh, stellar mass loss rate and keeping the other stellar parameters the same like the stellar uh, sort of wind velocity as modulated by the hydrodynamic escape parameter here. Um, and I'll talk more about some of our sort of like model assumptions if you want to ask me about that. Um, I think there's really interesting details we've thought a lot about like what do we want to model fully self-consistently? What do we want to model sort of approximately or prescriptively so that we can change those prescriptions and try to learn from that? Um, but uh, just like schematically here, I, I, I kind of love this picture because we go from the planet wind, which is this uh, dense material here wrapping in a full torus around uh, the star and the stellar wind occupies this cavity here and basically the stellar wind is forced to escape towards the poles um, and uh, not not in the equator which is sort of basically modulated by this donut of planet wind. Um, secondly if we zoom in what you can see is there's this region of unshocked planet wind which is essentially tidally limited. So the rotation of the planet orbit, so the rotation essentially of the frame of reference of the escaping wind limits the extent of it. So we see these boundary layers basically um, between the unshocked wind and the, and the shocked planet wind. Um, as we go up in stellar wind mass loss rate, Basically, what determines the interface between the two winds is a ram pressure balance. So ram pressure being uh, the density times the velocity squared. So basically, um, the, the, um, <clears throat> the basically energy in the, the kinetic energy per, per volume of that uh, wind material. And so, uh, what we see here is that there is a bow shock um, which traces this interface. And so you can see subtler shocks here in the stellar wind, in the hotter stellar wind. And then also um, these sort of similar shock features in the um, planet wind, which is being compressed. And along that interface, I think all sorts of like, I mean, I'm sort of a gas dynamics nerd. so. Uh, I could like sit and watch little eddies and vortices in a river, uh, like after flowing past a pylon or something, uh, happily all afternoon. But um, what we're seeing here are both shear instability, so things like Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities and uh, gravitational instabilities, so things like Raleigh Taylor, where dense material overlies lighter, um, lower density stellar wind. So these are. Uh, equilibria, so ram pressure balances, but unstable equilibria. And so we get these sort of time dependent flows. And then if the stellar wind goes up a lot more, um, we get basically all of the escaping planetary material really strongly confined to this really thin comet-like tail. And 
I think that word confinement is important. So uh, with the idea here being, look at how spread out the material is when the stellar wind is weak and how tightly compressed it is when the stellar wind is strong. So some of these things have been seen in simulations before. Um, uh, they are, I think, extremely interesting and we've used some of this uh, to validate our kind of new simulation method. Um, so I don't want to tell you that every one of the things that I just told you is, is really novel here, but um, I think they're really interesting dynamics of this sort of interactive region. Um, okay. So now I'm zooming in right around the exoplanet. So you can see that we're looking um, in slices again through the plane of the orbit. Um, and here X and Y are in units of planet radii. So it's plus or minus something like 15 planet radii. Um, and the top panel is the number density of uh, helium in the metastable state. And then the bottom panel is the line of sight velocity. So again, the star is over in the plus X direction uh, where my cursor is, if you all see that. And the observer is over here. Um, so uh, I colored the line of sight material that's coming towards us blue because that will be blue shifted in the sort of emergent spectrum and then red where we'll see red shifted material. So as we look at this plot, we can look at where there's dense ma wind material and what its kinematics is and use that to start to understand what we would see in a transmission spectrum um, during, during transit. And so uh, the last point I wanna emphasize here is that these contours are contours of uh, optical depth along the line of sight of metastable helium. So um, uh, the darkest line is tau of one, and then tau of 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and 10 to the minus three. So going from uh, one order of magnitude each. And so I think the thing to notice here is that when the stellar wind, the, the planet wind, <laughs> all these winds, um, uh, when the planet wind is relatively unperturbed by the stellar wind, you have a situation where the tau of one surface is close to the planet and mostly symmetric around it. Okay, it's not completely symmetric. As we zoom out, we have all this interesting stuff going on. We actually can see that in the spectral line, but um, but the dominant sort of, well, let's look at the tau of one surface here is, is basically symmetric relative to the planet. When this planet wind is really strongly confined, as in this case, we have a really asymmetric tau of one surface, which traces this high density material, which is squished into this tail. Um, and then secondly, uh, there's some interesting kinematics here. So blue shifted material just above and below the planet here. This is the day to night side flow. Um, and there are eddies back here. Um, the overall uh, sort of red shift versus blue shift is material expanding relative to the planet and either moving away from us or towards us. Um, and then in this strongest stellar wind case, a lot of this material is kind of swept up by the stellar wind. And so most of the gas that's giving uh, absorption features is going to be blue shifted just because of this uh, momentum of the stellar wind. Okay. So <laughs> why show you just one spectra when I could show you so many all at once? Um, <laughs> so this is a, perhaps a little overwhelming, but uh, I, the point I want to make is uh, not very detailed about any one spectral feature. So um, this line is a triplet. Um, so there are two blended lines. I'm showing you their rest wavelengths with these vertical dashed lines. Um, there are two blended lines and then um, a third. Um, and then uh, and uh, 
these are some of the synthetic spectra that we compute from the radiative transfer post-processing of a uh, simulation snapshot. And um, so we, we uh, do the radiative transfer to compute, for example, the ionization states of the gas um, in, in equilibrium with the sort of flux of the star. Um, and uh, what I think I would like you to see here is, is um, oh, I, I, one more piece of information I wanted to give you is that the optical transit itself is something like plus or minus about 1.8 hours, so plus or minus two hours, let's say. So these spectra here are during the optical transit. And these ones out here are outside the optical transit. And I think a couple things to see. One is that the line center shifts from bluer to redder during the optical transit in any of these cases. What we're actually just seeing there is the projection of the orbital motion of the planet. So a little bit before mid-transit, the planet is still coming towards us. A little bit after mid-transit, the planet is kind of going away from us a little bit. Um, now that, like, uh, that projection is small. The like trigonometry uh, is is like a small projection onto the line of sight, but um, you know it's a few kilometers per second, and that's um, so ten kilometers per second, something like 0.35 angstroms at at this wavelength. So. So that, that's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, the second thing is that um, these line shapes uh, change between uh, these different groups and between sort of different angles of looking through this material. And I'd say those changes are relatively minor during the optical transit, but outside the optical transit, especially following the optical transit, there can be significant absorption well after the planet is done transiting. And its spectral features can actually be kind of different from uh, the kinematics right near the planet. And that kind of makes sense. We're tracing a portion of the flow that's kind of like in the tail um, or in the... Um, whatever like the leading tail is, the nose, I don't know, um, of this uh, outflow. Um, and uh, so, so taking spectra at times other than the optical transit may actually be really informative into this wind-wind interaction because um, we're kind of like, we're probing those, those, those more complicated regions of the kinematics where the winds are interacting with each other. And the last thing I want to show you is if we take um, these spectra are beautiful, basically, and uh, there are observational equivalents. So James, for example, has led some work uh, using Keck to take um, to take a, a spectrum, um, but basically we tend to need to observe um, an entire transit. So for several hours, so like one night. Um, in order to get calibration spectra and a sort of sig good signal to noise during um, the transit. So generating uh, the observational equivalent of this diagram with you know 10 or 12 spectra all sampled at different times is actually a significant undertaking. So what if we take kind of like the simplest metric from these and one version of that is just the integral quantity of these, so the equivalent width. So if I ask what the um, total sort of absorption depth of these uh, lines are as a function of time, and there's some motivation for doing this because there's been some really kind of amazing work in the past year um, uh, from Polymar and Caltech uh, group where they are uh, using commercial very narrow band uh, filters to basically produce a light curve at this wavelength. Um, and so that's appealing because you can use, um, uh, because, you know, without sort of dispersing the, the light, you don't um, have quite the same like restrictiveness of, of uh, 
you know, uh, I lost my words, but you don't need as long of an exposure. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and, and basically what I'm intrigued by is that there is still a lot of information in this simplest sort of uh, quantity. And what we say is that the, um, what, that, that uh, the absorption is very symmetric around the obstacle of transit when uh, the stellar wind is not a strong effect. And it is very distorted relative to the optical transit when the stellar wind is a strong effect. And so I parameterized that here on the right in terms of, uh, you know, the simplest thing you might think of, a uh, Gaussian. And it's reflected in the amplitude and the mean of those Gaussian fits to the light curve. Um, there are almost certainly better ways to do that. But, um, but I, I think it's interesting that we're finding that there is significant absorption outside of the optical transits. And I think it's interesting that we might be able to use that to learn something about this sort of environment that those planets exist in. So I'll be delighted to hear your questions and thoughts. Great. Thank you. So if you have questions for Morgan, go ahead and raise your hand. I see a question from Drea. Hi, I'm not going to put my camera on because I'm hiding in my office and it's really ugly. But, but you mentioned using a narrowband filter to look at the helium line and you said that's yeah. wonderful and that's what the people are doing. You've got to be really careful because there are water vapor lines all through that region. Um, uh, really, especially when you're looking at stars that don't have high velocities. Um, yeah. And so you can get into trouble. So I just warn you <laughs> and everybody that when you look at uh, that with a filter, you you better be careful because there can be water vapor lines. That's yeah. all. And that's a really interesting point, which is obvious to you, but not obvious to me, which is that Given different stellar ve offset velocities, you might be in a better situation or a worse situation. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is um, well. Then, it, of course, it's going to depend on the velocity. I mean, I I have a little chart somewhere because we were dealing with this a lot. Um, mm. And and if you get a very high velocity star, you're golden because it'll move everything away. On the other oh, hand, interesting. Um, there are regions where it's real trouble and and the water vapor varies you know it's it's we're at water vapor in our atmosphere so i'm just i'm just throwing in a cautionary tale <laughs> right so it's time variable and you don't get to just you know calibrate it out in some obvious that's way right. that's right that's right that's right okay mm -hmm. that's all <laughs> no it's a really great point yeah I have a question and a kind of follow up to Andrea's point, which I think is that for that particular survey where they use the narrowband filter, they're simultaneously observing comparison stars, which they then divide out the targets light curves by the comparison light curves to try and remove the effects of water absorption. But it's a so, filter in all directions? Uh, yeah, I think it's just a like a sort of top hat filter. I'm not sure how wide it is. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I, I, I like spectroscopy, not the <laughs> colors, so I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's, it's a good point. Um, so yeah, I think it's an extremely narrow band filter, um, but uh, I don't know whether it's, you know, one nanometer or, you know, three. Okay, example. well, I'll send you some nice water lines in the helium line <laughs> if you'd like to see them. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the other question I had is, I presume the densities are low, so you're not doing any collisional excitation of that metastable level? That's right. That's right. So it's um, all just photo excitation. That's right. So in the situations we've looked at so far, um, the mass loss rate from WASP-107 is like, uh, a fraction of its mass over the Hubble time. So we haven't ever been lucky enough to like see a hot Jupiter 
like evaporating on the time scale of 10 to the seven years or something. Uh, I, you know, we very well might be in a situation where in nature there are collisionally, you know, like that that's very important, but like we haven't seen those. And so like catering to the like one or two objects that we're currently observing, we haven't been in that regime yet. So I, do you see what I'm saying in terms of like, I'm not treating that right now, but it's not to say that it's never important. Right, 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 right. How does your calculation compare with the Earth and its bow shock? I was sort of hoping you might show that. Yeah. So that's been well studied. It has. Do we yeah. see helium in the bow shock? I don't know. It's a great question. Um, sorry, I'm taking notes also as you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah. Great question. From Ian? Yep. Go ahead. Hey, Morgan. This is so cool. Uh, sorry if already uh, mentioned this before, but back in your uh, density plot for the, the highest mass loss rate, the 10 to 13th density yeah. one, and the zoom in, uh, is that another bow shock? Or is that just, yeah. just picking up material? So this oh, is wild. the stellar wind hitting the planet wind, and this is its. So this is shocked stellar wind here, and this is the compressed and shocked planet wind. Great. So um, it's much more clear in like a temperature plot where the stellar wind is much hotter than the planet wind. But... That's so cool. So yeah, it looks like it's yeah the stellar one's pretty low density. So do you, do you think that would even show up in the observational? Mostly, we're only seeing the uh, planet wind, also because the stellar wind, being you know a million Kelvin or something like that, uh, has very different uh, ionization state, for example. Okay. And so it, it doesn't necessarily populate the same levels that we are tracing with these particular observables. Um, so uh, I think that's not to say that we couldn't, for example, but I, I in the like metrics that we're using, we're mostly seeing the stellar wind. And so, sorry, the planet wind. And so then like we see the stellar winds impact only then indirectly. Sure, yeah, thanks so much. And sorry if I can sneak in like a super quick question too. Which code did you use to simulate this? Um, I'm using Athena++. Plus plus. Um, oh, so yeah. this is a grid-based hydrodynamic code. Um, the uh, geometry of this is that I'm yeah. doing this in spherical polar coordinates around the star right. um, and uh, in a rotating reference frame. And so, right. so that no makes- So a Cartesian grid. That's, that's fantastic. That makes um, doing the radiative transfer post-processing easier because you look along radial lines of sight from the star and you get to sum along like one axis of the mesh where you already have data. So you don't have to interpolate between mesh points, for example. For sure. Yeah. Thanks, um, Morgan. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, so there's no further questions. So thank you to both our speakers again. And thank you all. I'm really grateful for the time to be here, but also for your questions and, and thoughts. Yeah, I really appreciate you all. Thanks so much. If there's no announcements, we'll see you again in two weeks. Is that right, James? Yep, that's right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone.